Alrighty, sorry about the delay. <laughs> Had a minor issue. Alrighty, welcome back to Free Read Fridays. Your intrepid narrator, as always, Fragoth. And today, we're going to be resuming our read-through of Quarantine by Greg Egan. Um, I do have to remember to bookmark the webpage that explains what's going on afterwards. He's got kind of a coda where he explains these are the ideas that were going through my head. And I find that to be nicely revealing and useful. Uh, so previously on... Previously on. What happened? Oh, right. Uh, so our protagonist, whose name eludes me at the moment because it's told from first person. We've heard it referenced, I think, once. Ooh! Who is a PI, a protagonist? Mr. Stavrianos. Nick Stavrianos? Jake? Something like that. Uh, Mr. Stavrianos is our protagonist, and he is basically a PI. He's a private investigator, and he's been tasked with finding this woman, uh, Laura Andrews who is supposed to have severe congenital brain damage. Uh, quote, she can walk and eat clumsily, but she can't communicate in any fashion. And the experts say that she understands the world little better than a six-month-old child. Since the age of five, she's been an inpatient at the local Hilgeman Institute. And then uh, she disappeared. <laughs> um, one of the big reveals I think we got, if memory serves, is that the time she has disappeared is not the first time she has disappeared. Uh, in fact, she's vanished, I think, twice before, and they found her, like, walking around in the park or just outside um, each time. Uh, this time, however, she's been gone, I think, like, four weeks, um, which is long, apparently, for her to be gone. I mean, considering she's locked in a room all day, most days. Uh, yeah, probably a long time. Uh, so yeah, uh, just give me one moment here, and uh, and we'll get rocking and rolling. Um, lots of world building goes on in this book. Uh, in fact, most of the book isn't really about, um, you know, the actual mystery and everything. It's it's about here's the world being built here's like the world that this character and these characters live in so it's a whole thing it's pretty cool i like it all right give me one sec here Should probably note at this time that this is likely going to be one of the sh going to be a short one. Um, I am coming getting over a stomach bug at the moment, so my energy's a little low. My apologies. Eat some bad ham. Oh yeah, the other important thing. Um, Earth is now inside a bubble that's about the size of the solar system. A little bit bigger. Uh, it extends out a bit past uh, the orbit of Pluto, I think. Um, I can't remember if it's out into the Oort. It's big. Uh, it does enclose the system. Ah, here we go. It is quite a ways out. Uh, the bubble is a perfect sphere, 12 billion kilometers in radius, which is about as wide, about twice as wide as the orbit of Pluto, and centered on the sun. So it's very big. It's, a v I mean, relatively speaking. <laughs> Uh, like, we would be hard-pressed uh, with currently existing technology to travel out that distance in any reasonable time frame. Um, I mean, it could be done, but probably not on a manned probe. 
Alrighty. Chapter 2. Hallelujah! I can see them! I can see the stars! I turn, startled, to see a young woman on her knees in the, in the middle of a crowded street. Arms in the... Okay, let's try this from the top. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah! I can see them! I can see the stars! I turn, startled, to see a young woman on her knees in the middle of the crowded street, arms outstretched, gazing ecstatically into the dazzling blue sky. For a moment she seems to be frozen, transfixed, enraptured. Then she screams again, I can see them! I can see them! and starts pounding her ribs, rocking back and forth on her knees, gasping and sobbing. But that cult died out twenty years ago. The woman shrieks and twitches. Two embarrassed friends stand beside her while the traffic smoothly det detours around the scene. I watch with mounting dismay as childhood memories of ranting, convulsing street mystics start flooding back. All the beautiful stars, all the glorious constellations, Scorpius, Libra, Centaurus, tears stream down her face. I fight down a sense of panic and revulsion that's growing out of all proportion. This is just one woman, just one freak. The very fact that she's such a spectacle only proves what a rarity this is, proves that most people have adapted, have accepted the bubble, and moved on. What am I afraid of? That every last form of bubble hysteria, every last obscure religious sect, every last bizarre mass psychosis is destined to be revived? As I turn away, the woman's companions suddenly burst out laughing. A moment later, she joins them. And, belatedly, I think I understand. Astral Sphere is back in fashion, that's all. A planetarium in the skull. A gimmick, not an epiphany. I've read the reviews. The mod offers a variety of settings, ranging from a realistic view of the stars, quote, exactly as they would be, unquote, complete with accurate diurnal and seasonal motions, masking by clouds and buildings and convincing fade-ins at dusk and fade-outs at dawn, through to the dissolution of all obstacles, the sunlit atmosphere and the earth beneath your feet included, and the option of moving the point of view millennia into the past or the future, or halfway across the galaxy. The trio are falling in and out of each other's arms now, laughing. The cult is being mocked, not revived. These teenagers must have seen it portrayed in some old documentary. I walk on, feeling slightly foolish, and greatly relieved. When I reach my building, I take the stairs slowly, reluctant to face an empty calls log again. I've had ads in all the news systems for four days running, and they've yet to attract even a hoax call. The new year should have helped. News system readership increases on public holidays, when people have nothing better to do. Maybe $10,000 isn't a large enough reward, but I doubt that my client would appreciate me doubling it. Not that I'm any closer to knowing who my client is. The Hilgeman's patient records listed no one with family ties to spectacular wealth or fame. And in retrospect, I'm not surprised. The very rich would, at the very least, take care that the records were meticulously falsified, and the obscenely wealthy would keep their demented relatives right out of harm's way, in soundproof wings of their own impenetrable mansions. I'm tempted to dig deeper, but I won't. I may suffer the, purely aesthetic, urge to incorporate my client into the big picture, but as yet I have no good reason to believe that it would help me find Laura. No calls. I resist punching the sofa. The upholstery has already split to the point where further damage yields diminishing satisfaction. It's getting close to the deadline for lodging the ad for more bleh, for lodging the ad for one more day. I display the copy on my terminal and stare at it glumly, wondering if there's anything I could change that would make a difference, short of adding a zero or two to the reward. 
I've used a picture of Laura straight from the Hilgeman's patient records. It closely matches my own received mental image, suggesting that my client's knowledge of Laura's appearance was based on the very same shot. Her face is distinctive, but who knows what she looks like by now. No need for plastic surgery. A good synthetic skin mask is all that's required. I lodged the ad again, for what it's worth. If Laura was taken by accident, she'd be long dead by now, and I doubt that I'd ever find the body, let alone the people responsible. My only real hope is that not only did her kidnappers have some obscure reason for deliberating abducting, deliberately abducting her, but whatever it was, it required them to do something riskier than merely locking her up or slaughtering her. Like smuggling her out of the country. Getting Laura onto a plane would not be difficult. Her imbecility would be almost as easy to conceal as her face. There are dozens of illegal mods which could transform her into the walking puppet of a traveling companion, or even a semi-autonomous robot, capable of such rudimentary tasks as, tasks as laughing and crying at all the right moments during the in-flight movie. Faking an exit visa record in the Foreign Affairs database is no big deal. It would vanish an hour or two later, and the airline's files would also be appropriately amended. Foreign Affairs, Customs, and the airlines are all being screwed blind, 24 hours a day, by a hundred different hackers. And, ironically, that's what makes it possible, if you're lucky, to trace an illegal traveler. Hackers may run rings around the target system's own archaic security, but they can't avoid making their presence known to each other. In the process of capturing data essential for their own work, they can't help capturing details of other violations in progress. Like all information, this is for sale. Oh, thanks for tuning in, Toku Geeky. I'm sorry, I didn't see it earlier. Bella is acting as a broker for me, as well as providing some data of her own. I call her and download another batch. The relevance of my one heap of raw data is a matter of luck. The more you buy, the better the odds. But there's no guarantee of success when the event you're trying to trace took place, if at all, at an unknown air airport or at an unknown time in the last five weeks. Finding the fake exit visas is easy. The very fact that they have to be wiped to avoid sluggish official security, scru whoops, to avoid sluggish official scrutiny, betrays their existence in any time series of illicit snapshots of the database. The problem is finding Laura in the crowd. There are over 100 illegal exits per week nationwide. From the Hilgeman, I have her DNA signature, fingerprints, retinal patterns, and skeletal measurements. DNA isn't used by customs. There are too many complications, legal and cultural, in sampling international travelers en masse. But the other three are always checked and must match for pre-departure clearance. After that, though, the common practice is to change these details in the fake visa record, precisely to make things harder for people like me. Although the record itself must persist for the duration of the flight, with the name and photo unchanged, to avoid triggering various anti-terrorist checks carried out by the airlines, the biological ID data isn't accessed again until the passenger goes through customs at their destination. So, there are only two brief periods when the visa record needs to contain anything truthful. In theory, these times could be measured in milliseconds, but in practice, things can't be tuned that finely, and the windows have to be several minutes long. However, fingerprints and retinal patterns are relatively easy to alter by nanosurgery, leaving only the bone lengths to be, tr to be trusted. They can be modified, too, if you're desperate, but nobody walks onto a plane straight after that kind of reconstruction, puppet or not and traveling as an obvious invalid would be like carrying a sign around your neck. I analyze the latest series of snapshots. In no time at all, they prove as worthless as the rest. I flip idly through the gigabytes of junk that I've accumulated. Flight after flight from the country's ten international airports. Everything from menus to seating plans to... cargo manifests. Of course, Laura could have been sent as cargo, but it wouldn't have been a very smart choice. 
All cargo is either x-rayed or manually inspected, so there is only one kind of cargo that a human being can mimic, a human corpse. Achieving the resemblance would be no problem. Drugs which shut down the metabolism for a couple of hours, without damage to the brain or any other organ, have been available for decades. What makes the method unattractive is the signal-to-noise ratio. The sheer number of illegal live passengers is itself a kind of camouflage, but only one or two corpses are flown out of the country each week. Still, I have nothing better to do, so I search through the cargo records and the data I've collected so far, and come up with seven corpses. The routine security x-rays taken of every passenger also provide the basis for computing the set of skeletal measurements used as an ID check. Corpses, though, aren't checked for ID. As with any other cargo, the x-ray images, a stereoscopic pair, are simply inspected by eye, then stored in the manifest. It takes me half an hour to track down a copy of the algorithm used by the airports to compute bone lengths. It's part of the x-ray machine's firmware, separate from the main passenger systems, so it isn't present in any of my stolen memory dumps. I wouldn't have wanted to cobble together a version of my own. The mathematics for converting data from stereo pairs to three-dimensional coordinates may be trivial, but automating the identification of the various bones is not. I run the program on my seven corpses, checking for a match to Laura's data, and get seven consecutive negatives. Perversely, just as I'm struck by a reason why the kidnappers might have chosen this path, after all. It's conceivable that Laura's brain damage prevented them from using a puppet mod. Many off-the-shelf mods explicitly rely explicitly on the existence of certain neural structures which everyone supposedly has in common, but which Laura might be lacking. No doubt any such problems could be circumvented, given time, but mapping Laura's non-standard brain and reprogramming the nanomachines accordingly would be no trivial matter. Other solutions would have looked tempting. The lack of a positive result rules out nothing. The x-rays in the cargo record could have been fudged, a few minutes after they were taken. Computerized information is as evanescent as the quantum vacuum, with virtual truths and falsehoods endlessly popping in and out of existence. Deceptions of any magnitude are possible, on a short enough time scale. Laws only apply to data that sits still long enough to be caught out. I skim through the X-ray uh, analysis program, curious to see how it works, but the code for anatomical feature recognition is pretty dull stuff, an interminable list of rules and exceptions, and the rest is a few lines of formulae. I had a faint, nagging doubt that differences in geometry between the cargo and passenger X-ray systems might have been giving me garbage results, but in fact all the relevant dimensions are stored with the image pairs themselves, neatly tagged with standard descriptors, and the program takes nothing for granted. Once the bone lengths have been computed, a match is declared if any discrepancies fall within an age-dependent tolerance limit, which makes allowance for the possibility of small changes since the visa was issued. This tolerance is highest, of course, for children and adolescents, and not much leeway is granted at Laura's age. Perhaps I should increase it? Customs may prefer to err on the side of false negatives, but I'd rather make the opposite mistake. I realize my stupidity with a jolt. I'm still thinking of in terms of passengers. A fake corpse doesn't need to be ambulatory. No skeletal reconstruction, however crippling, can be ruled out which leaves me without a single piece of data that I can trust. That's not quite true. Most bones can be altered, if a period of convalescence is acceptable, but it's next to impossible to mess with certain parts of the skull, without the tampering being both dangerous and obvious. I modify the match criteria, stripping away all the other comparisons. When I run this new version, a matching record appears at once. Cargo ID 18430954. Flight Cantus 295. Departure Perth 1306, 23rd December 2067. Arrival New Hong Kong 1422, 23rd December 2067. Contents Human remains Han Su Lian. Sender 
New Hong Kong Consulate General, 16 St. George's Terrace, Perth, 6000-0030016, Australia. Addressee, Wan Che Funerals, 132 Li Tung Street, Wan Che, 1135-0940-132, New Hong Kong. A match on the basis of five skull measurements could be a coincidence. It could be deliberate misinformation. Why wouldn't the kidnappers have altered the x-rays, wiping out even this hint of the truth? I checked the time the snapshot was taken. 12.53. Their cargo would have been x-rayed just two or three minutes before. You don't risk changing data when a customs officer might be staring right at it. Ten minutes later, though, and every trace of Laura Andrews would have been gone. I shake my head, still suspicious. I don't often get this lucky. Karen leans over my shoulder and says, That's the definition of luck, you moron. Hurry up and pack. Rather, that's the definition of luck, you moron. Hurry up and pack. Whatever. New Hong Kong was founded on January 1st, 2029. Eighteen months before, on the 30th anniversary of Hong Kong's absorption into the People's Republic of China. Oh, how close is he? How close? I'm going to be upset if he's close. 30th anniversary. Okay, okay. Demonstrations against the suspension of the Basic Law had ended in violent repression, a crackdown on dissent, and a massive increase in the rate of illegal emigration. While everyone else in the region offered the emigrants squalid refugee camps ringed with barbed wire and the prospect of spending half their lives in a stateless limbo, the Tribal Confederation of Arnhem Land offered 2,000 square kilometers on a mangrove-infested peninsula in northern Australia. No 99-year lease this time, sovereignty in perpetuity, in exchange for a piece of the action. Arnhem Land, and I may be mispronouncing that, and I apologize if there's any actual Aussies out there, um, A-R-N-H-E-M, Land. That's two separate words. If, I'm, if that's Arnhem, great. If it's something else, then I'm sorry. Where the Arnhem land, where the remnants of half a dozen or aboriginal tribes were trying to re-establish their near-obliterated culture, had been independent itself only since 2026, and there was talk in Australia of cutting off the aid that kept it afloat, partly in response to Chinese threats of trade sanctions, but also out of sheer childish resentment that the fledgling nation had dared to take its autonomy seriously. The Australian government's own stunningly creative proposal had been to house 60,000 refugees in a disused leper colony on the northwest coast, for however many decades it took to farm them out around the world at a politically acceptable rate. The aid survived, but the project was widely ridiculed by the Australian media and their pet economists, who referred to it as subletting the nation, and predicted a social and financial disaster. International investors thought otherwise. Money flooded in. There was nothing humanitarian about this. It simply reflected the global economic situation at the time. The Koreans, especially, had been going crazy trying to find projects to soak up all their excess wealth. Creating the infrastructure from scratch must have been daunting, but the site was reasonably close to the booming industrial centers of Southeast Asia, where there was engineering expertise and manufacturing capacity to spare. Making, you full, making full use of new construction techniques, the core of the city was functional and occupied within seven years. Not a moment too soon. In 2036, the PRC invi invaded Taiwan, giving rise to a new wave of refugees. In the decades that followed, cycles of political and economic reform came and went in Beijing, each one ending in an outflux of disillusioned members of the skilled middle class, with only one place to go. 
While China grew more impoverished, more impoverished and insular, new Hong Kong prospered. By 2056, its GDP had outstripped Australia's. So for those of you paying attention to world events, particularly as they pertain to uh, the People's Republic of China, take some notes on dates and let's see how close our boy Greg Egan will get in the next uh, 13 years. 13? 14 years. Next 14 years. Whoo boy. He nailed that, didn't he? Well, he got close. <laughs> he got close. So far. China hasn't invaded Taiwan yet. Yet. <laughs> yet. Uh, I kid. I don't really kid. I digress is what I do. All right. At, at Mach 2 plus, 3,000 kilometers takes a little more than an hour. I'm far from any window, but I switch my entertainment screen to the scenic channel and watch the desert go by. I leave the headphones off to avoid the fatuous audio commentary, but I can't work out how to make the distracting text and graphics overlays vanish. Eventually, I give up and tell Boss to put me out of it until we arrive. Monsoon rain pounds the runway as the plane touches down, but five minutes later I step out of the airport into dazzling sunshine, and, after an hour of artificial 20-degree blandness, heat and humidity as palpable as a slap in the face. To the north I can glimpse the cranes of the harbor between the skyscrapers, to the east a patch of blue, the Gulf of Carpentaria. I'm right beside an entrance to the underground, but since the rain has stopped, I decide to walk to my hotel. This is my first time in NHK, but I've loaded Deja Vu, Global Visage, $750, with an up-to-date street map and information package. He has been in this place before. Sleek black towers from the early days alternate with the modern style, ornamental facades in imitation jade and gold, carved with ingenious fractal reliefs that catch the eye on a dozen different scales. Every building is topped with the giant logo of some major, major financial or information service. It always seems absurd to me that money or data should need a flag of convenience, but laws change slowly, and the laissez-faire regulations that have apparently tempted hundreds of transnationals to shift their head offices to this, ju to this jurisdiction, bleh, if only to await the day when they can incorporate incorporeally. <laughs> oh my gosh, say that five times fast. Thanks, Greg. If only to await the day when they can incorporate incorporeally, oh, I love that, as waves of tax-free data flowing between orbiting supercomputers. At street level, the towers are all but hidden by the undergrowth of small traders. Daylight holograms in Pai Hua and English crowd the air, each with a stream of flashing darts pointing out a narrow entrance or a tiny cubicle that might otherwise easily be missed. Processors, neural mods, and entertainment ROMs are on sale within meters of junk jewelry, fast food, and nanoware cosmetics. The crowd I move through looks prosperous. Executives, traders, students, and plenty of the right kind of tourists. Twelve degrees south of the equator is about as far as most northern tourists will go. They want a winter tan, not the promise of a melanoma. Decades after the phasing out of the last ozone-depleting pollutants, the stratosphere remains contaminated, and the hole, which spreads out from Antarctica each spring, is still severe enough to turn the latitude cancer risk equation upside down. Sunlight is far more dangerous in the southern temperate zone than it is in the tropics. Let's reread that sentence real quick. I think I mangled the pacing and cadence. Give me a sec. Decades after the phasing out of the last ozone-depleting pollutants, the stratosphere remains contaminated. 
and the hole, which spreads out from Antarctica each spring, is still severe enough to turn the latitude cancer risk equations upside down. Sunlight is far more dangerous in the southern temperate zone than it is in the tropics. I'd better rapidly switch off my parochial UV belt prejudice, and stop thinking of pale skin as marking out religious fanatics and genetic purity freaks. Not many people born here, or in old Hong Kong, would have bothered with the melanin boost, but there's a visible component of black-skinned Southerners, Australian-born immigrants, of both Asian and European descent, so I may not be quite as conspicuously foreign as I feel. The Renaissance Hotel was the least expensive I could find, but it's still discon... I should actually explain what he's talking about there. So, uh, <laughs> it, it occurs to me that that could be a very confusing paragraph. Basically, what he's saying is because the ozone layer in this uh, hypothetical future is deeply screwed, um, deeply, deeply, deeply screwed, um, what people have been doing is... Uh, people who have to live in the areas that are affected by this hole in the ozone layer, uh, have to get basically uh, genetic augments uh, to boost their melanin count. So basically everybody south of a certain uh, latitude is black, uh, or would look that way. Um, very, very dark skin in order to not have skin cancer all the time. <laughs> boosted melanin. Very boosted. Um, so that's what he's talking about. He's kind of uh, setting the cultural tone and, uh, I guess, his concerns about being very noticeable compared to the rest of the people, a lot of the rest of the people that are there. And he's finding it's maybe not quite as bad as he thought. The Renaissance Hotel was the least expensive I could find, but it's still disconcertingly luxurious, all red and gold carpet and giant murals of da Vinci sketches. NHK has no cheap accommodation. Penniless backpackers simply don't get visas. I hate having my luggage carried, but I'd hate the fuss of refusing it even more. Several discreet signs advise against tipping. Deja Vu discreetly advises otherwise and lets me know the going rate. My room itself is small enough to make me feel slightly less profligate, and, it, and the view consists of nothing but a portion of the Axon building, the facade of which is tastefully adorned with the names of all their best-selling neural mods, spelled out in a dozen languages and repeated in all directions, like some abstract geometri geometric tiling pattern. Letters cut into imitation black marble don't exactly catch the eye, but perhaps that's intentional. After all, Axon grew out of a company which peddled subliminal learning tools, audio and videotapes bearing inaudible or invisible messages, supposedly perceived directly by the subconscious. Like all the other self-improvement snake oil of the time, this did more than provide placebo effects for the gullible and megabucks for the rip-off merchants. It also helped create the market for a technology that did work once such a thing was actually invented. I unpack, shower, and belatedly put all the clocks in my head forward one and a half hours, then sit on the bed and try to decide exactly how I'm going to find Laura in a city of 12 million people. The funeral notices, the funeral notices say that Han Su Lin was cremated on December 24th, and no doubt the body that went into the furnace looked just like her, although presumably the real Han Su Lin never left Perth. All this corpse shuffling is fascinating, but it doesn't get me very far. If I talk to anyone at the funeral company, I risk tipping off the kidnappers. Ditto for the airline's cargo handlers. All the people most likely to have seen something useful are also the most likely to have been involved in the swap themselves. So where does that leave me? I still know nothing about the kidnappers, nothing about their motives, nothing about their plans. Apart from having narrowed the search, geographically, I'm back to square one. All I have to go on is Laura herself, brain-damaged and immobile. I might as well be hunting for an inanimate object. But she's not an inanimate object. She's a human being convalescing from skeletal reconstruction. Convalescing. What does that entail? 
highly skilled nursing and physiotherapy, assuming that her kidnappers care whether or not she ends up permanently crippled. Medication, certainly. If she's worth keeping alive at all, they can't be disregarding her health entirely. But what medication? What particular drugs? I have no idea. So, I'd better find out. Dr. Pangloss is my favorite knowledge miner. Unlike Bella, who steals data which is supposed to be secure, Pangloss legally digs up facts which are, laughably, supposed to be easily accessible to anyone, for a few dollars, at the touch of a few keys. His mask, with powdered wig and beauty spot, always makes me think of Moliere, rather than Voltaire, and his accent is pure RSC, but there's no quibbling about his mining skills. He answers my question in 30 seconds flat. I could have consulted the same expert systems, databases, and libraries myself, but it would have taken me hours. A patient in Laura's condition would have several pharmacological requirements, each of which could be met by a variety of substances, each in turn marketed under several different trade names, and each available from a choice of local suppliers. Pangloss arranges all of this for me in a neat tree diagram in midair, then sends a copy down the data channel. I call Bella, pass her the list of pharmaceutical suppliers, and ask for their delivery records for the last three months. Five hours, she says. Your password is Nocturne. Five hours. I spend ten minutes staring out the window, trying to think of something useful to do in the meantime. Nothing comes to mind, so I decide to eat. The hotel's grand floor gra <laughs> The hotel's ground floor restaurant looks stuffy and expensive, so I wander out in search of fast food. NHK NHK has its own distinctive cuisine, mainly Cantonese in ancestry, but full of local quirks, like crocodile meat from Arnhem Land. Delicious, according to Deja Vu, so long as you're not put off by the possibility of secondary cannibalism. I settle for fried rice. I still have hours to kill, so I walk on, aimlessly. I tell myself I'm going to think about the case, but the truth is I'm sick of chasing the same details in the same endless circles, and I let my mind go blank. The rush-hour crowd presses around me, full of tense and anxious faces, which usually makes me tense and anxious myself, but right now I seem to be immune, as if I haven't yet tuned into the city, and can't yet be touched by its moods. I step into a false dusk, the shadow of the Pan-Pacific Bank Tower, a hundred-story cylinder sheathed in corroded gold. Deja Vu gives me the tourist spiel. Su Chao Chung's most famous and controversial work, completed in 2063. The metallic-looking cladding is in fact a polymer. The fractal dimension of the surface is an unsurpassed 2.7. The commentary is more abstract than an auditory hallucination, more like vividly imagined or remembered speech, a documentary soundtrack effortlessly recalled. The catch is, the mod also pumps out a deliberate subtext, a sense of growing familiarity, a sense that you're gaining the most profound and intimate knowledge, a sense that with each piece of pre-digested trivia you swallow, you're fast approaching an understanding of the place to rival that of any lifelong citizen. This is precisely the delusion that every tourist wants, but personally, I'd rather stay slightly less complacent. The sky grows dark quickly once the sun truly sets. Karen walks beside me, silent at first, but I only need the sight of her in the corner of my eye and the faint scent of her skin to take the edge off my loneliness. We find ourselves in an open-air market, an endless expanse of stalls and tables piled with souvenirs, trinkets, and high-tech consumer junk. Clashing multicolored light spilling from the holograms jostling above the stalls like demon sproikers renders everything in the strangest hues. Do we want an intelligent salad maker? 
faster and more dexterous than any mere human with a chef mod? She shakes her head. What about this? A uh, key eliminator. Memorizes and mimics the geometric, electrical, magnetic, and optical properties of up to 1,000 different keys, active or passive. I don't think so. Come on. My hotel bill's under the quota. I have to buy something or they'll never let me in again. The Chamber of Commerce computer will veto my visa application. How about a horoscope? She nods towards a nearby astrologer's booth. My stomach tightens. Since when did you believe in that shit? A young boy turns to stare at me, addressing empty space, but his friend grabs his elbow and drags him on, whispering an explanation. I don't. Just humor me. I glance at the booth and force out a laugh. Astrology. Without any fucking stars. That says it all. Her face is unreadable. Humor me? My guts are swarming, or my guts are squirming, but I say, almost calmly, Okay, if you want a horoscope, I'll buy you a horoscope. April 10th. She shakes her head. Not mine, you idiot. Laura's. I stare at her, then shrug. There's no point arguing. I still have all the Hilgeman patient records in my head. Laura was born on August 3rd, 2035. The astrologer is a shaven-headed girl, four or five years old, dressed in fake silk and dripping glass jewelry. I give her Laura's details. She sits cross-legged on a cushion and writes with a bamboo pen on Ersat's parchment. Her calligraphy is rapid, but undeniably elegant. The mod for it must have cost a fortune. Manual skills never come cheap. When she's covered the sheet, she turns it over and writes an English version on the back. I hand her my credit card, put my thumb to the scanner. When I take the parchment, she clasps her hands together and bows. Karen has vanished. I read the prediction, which boils down to success in business and happiness in love, after many tribulations. I crumple the sheet and toss it in a bin, then head back for the hotel. I ring Bella, download the pharmaceutical supplier's records, and start hunting for patterns. I don't feel much like trusting the hotel room's terminal, so I do the analysis in my head. Cipher Clerk has a virtual workstation, with all the usual data shuffling facilities. Pangloss specified five categories of drugs. 109 different businesses score five out of five. I start wading through their and. What? I start wading through their animated presentations in the phone directory. Not surprisingly, it looks like they're all going to turn out to be either major hospitals, where orthopedic reconstruction is carried out, or cosmetic surgery clinics, specializing in much the kind of thing that Laura must have gone through. Nose jobs, cheek jobs, rib removals, hand reshaping, vertebrae adjustments, limb reductions and extensions. I, never, I can never quite believe that anyone would undergo this kind of mutilation for the sake of fashion, but dozens of smiling customers testified to their satisfaction right f before my eyes. Laura could be hidden in any one of these places. A big enough bribe would silence any awkward questions. But every outsider brought in on the kidnapping is one more unreliable amateur, one more potential informant. Better to be self-contained. The 93rd entry on the list, Biomedical Development International, displays nothing but an animated logo as unenlightening as its name. The letters BDI, rendered in shiny chromed tubing, constantly rotating and endlessly sparkling with implausible-looking highlights and a single line of text. Contract Research in Biotechnology, Neurotechnology, and Pharmaceuticals. I plow through the rest, but apart from the Osteoplasty Research Group of New Hong Kong, every other entry is some kind of hospital or clinic seeking out customers. This proves nothing, but I'd certainly like to know what kind of contract research BDI has been doing lately. I almost call Bella, then I change my mind. If I am getting close, I'd better start taking more care. 
Bella is good, but no hacker can guarantee that they won't be detected. And the last thing I want is to uh, the last thing I want to do is panic the kidnappers into moving Laura again. I find BDI in a business directory. Because they're not listed on the stock exchange, disclosure requirements are minimal. Founded in 2065, wholly owned by an NHK citizen, Wei Pai Ling, I've heard of him, a moderately wealthy entrepreneur with a wide range of profitable but unspectacular technological interests. It's half past two. I shut down Cypher Clerk and slump into bed. Biomedical Development International. Maybe I was right the first time. Maybe some pharmaceutical company whose product screwed up Laura's brain is preparing for a future lawsuit. Everything would make perfect sense. Well, almost. Why would BDI, or whoever they hired to collect Laura, break into the Hilgeman only to let her out of her room twice before the actual kidnapping? Why would anyone? It's bizarre. If the point was to create the impression that Laura could escape on her own, who did they think they were kidding? As I stare at the ceiling, trying to choose sleep, the incident with the astrologer keeps running through my head. Karen is not compelled to behave in character. Sometimes she's true to my memories, sometimes she's pure wish-fulfillment, sometimes her actions are as cryptic as the plot of a dream. But why should I dream uh, her asking for Laura's horoscope, of all things? Sheer perversity? Karen would never have done such a thing in a million years. I try to relax, to forget it, but I can't. The irony doesn't escape me. Nothing offends me more than the pathological assignment of meaning— religion, astrology, superstitions of any kind. And here I am, hunting for meaning in the actions of a subconsciously controlled hallucination of my dead wife. What kind of ludicrous necromancy is that? Horoscopes. Propitious birthdays. My skin crawls. I summon up the pilfered Hilgeman data again. Laura was born on August 3rd, 2035. The birth was slightly premature. Her medical records states her medical records state that the gestation period was thirty seven to thirty eight weeks. That puts the date of conception within a week of november fifteenth, twenty thirty four, perhaps even on bubble day itself. Of itself this means nothing to me. It would have meant nothing to Karen. There are probably ten billion people on the planet who wouldn't give a shit if the stars went out the very moment Laura's father came. None of which matters, none of which counts, none of which renders the coincidence meaningless and safe. The question is, what does it signify to the children of the abyss? Marcus Dupre was born on Bubble Day, in the small town of Hartshaw, Maine, sometime during the Earth's last 16 minutes of starlight. At what age he began to attach significance to this fact is anybody's guess. Dupre himself isn't telling, and his parents, his grandparents, his aunts, his uncles, his cousins, most of his teachers, and most of his peers, all died together on his 20th birthday, which he celebrated by introducing toxic bacteria into the Hartshaw water supply. His third grade and seventh grade teachers, lucky enough to have moved out of town, could scarcely remember him. Surviving ex-classmates described him as quiet and slightly aloof, but not studious and not introverted enough to have attracted ridicule. Charismatic? Influential? A born leader? A prophet? No. Computer files had little to add. His parents were not religious. His academic record was mediocre, his classroom behavior unremarkable, or at least unremarked upon. After finishing high school, he worked for the local water utility, performing what was described as unskilled and semi-skilled maintenance. No doubt he accessed online libraries extensively in his youth, but only a few months of data is retained in most systems, and by the time anyone went looking for Dupre's formative reading, the details had been purged long ago. If he ever bought books or ROMs, he took them with him when he fled, 
His rented room was found empty of all possessions. What would have explained away 3,000 corpses? Books on Charles Manson and Jim Jones? A diary full of teenage alienation? A tarot pack? A zodiac chart? Pentagrams in blood on the floor? Dupre was captured more than six years later, hiding out in rural Quebec. By this time, he had followers worldwide, blowing up trains and buildings, poisoning canned food, gunning down crowds of shoppers. Most of the killings were random, but one group of children had murdered six members of a European bubble research team, and many more such assassinations were to follow. Bubble science, to the children, is the ultimate blasphemy. After all, any detailed understanding of the bubble's true nature could only undermine their vision of the empty sky as a cosmic portent of the Age of Mayhem, which they believe they're ushering in. Dupre was found to be sane enough to stand trial. He was no paranoid schizophrenic. He heard no voices, saw no visions, suffered no more delusions than any other religious leader. I saw the leaked transcripts of one of his psychiatric evaluations. When asked bluntly whether he thought the genocide in Hartshaw was right or wrong, he said that he understood the concepts but believed they were no longer applicable. That symmetry was broken in the early universe, but now it has been restored. The two forces have become unified again. Good and evil are indistinguishable. Most of his answers were in this style, metaphors from science and religion dragged out of context and hybridized at random in, and hybridized at random into eclectic non sequiturs and hollow aphorisms. Quantum mysticism, pop cosmology, radi radical Gaiaist eco babble, Eastern transcendentalism, Western eschatology. Dupre, omnivorous, had swallowed it all, and had managed to unify the jargon, if not the ideas. The psychiatrists never put a name to this condition, but apparently it didn't constitute a defense of criminal insanity. Karen and I watched the live broadcasts of the trial in the early hours of the morning. We'd finally synchronized shifts. I was trying to get promoted into a counter-terrorist unit, so I wanted to learn all I could about the children. Karen was working as a registrar in the casualty department of the new southern... Whoops, of the new northern suburbs hospital, a job which often sounded more like police work than my own. Both our careers were stagnating. She was ten years out of medical school, I'd spent fourteen years in uniform. We both felt our chances were slipping away. Neither the prosecution nor the defense wanted speeches from Dupre or anything else which might inflame his disciples, so he was never put on the stand, and the question of motive was scarcely raised. The evidence linking him to the weapons dealer, turned prosecution witness, who'd supplied the engineered bacteria he'd used, was complex and tedious, but ultimately watertight. The trial dragged on for months, but the outcome was never in doubt. Haley's Comet was no spectacle in 2061, as seen from the Earth. The geometry was unfavorable. At its closest approach, it was swamped in sunlight, leaving it barely visible to the naked eye anywhere on the planet. A dozen probes pursued it, though, fusion-powered craft able to match its difficult orbit, and even a couple of vintage space-borne telescopes, commissioned prior to the bubble, were reactivated for the occasion. The pictures from these sources were breathtaking, and throughout June and July there were two stories on the HV News almost every night, two images almost guaranteed to be shown one after the other. The comet, streaming tails of yellow-white dust and vivid blue plasma, traveling out of the darkness, out of the abyss, toward the sun, and Marcus Dupre, sitting impassively in a courtroom in Maine. On August 4th, Dupre was sentenced to 60,840 years imprisonment. He had been tried alone for the Hartshaw Massacre, but throughout 2060 and 2061, the children had been infiltrated successfully in many cities, and a total of 17 other key members had been imprisoned. The end of the Age of Mayhem, proclaimed Newslink, beneath a picture of a voodoo doll in the image of Dupre, pierced by seventeen needles and oozing blood from every wound. On September 4th, three ex-jurors were murdered. 
The rest were immediately taken into protective custody, and subsequently given lifelong police protection. To date, though, two more have been assassinated. On October 4th, the trial judge survived the bombing of her home. The district attorney and his bodyguard were fatally shot in an elevator. On November 4th, the courtroom where Dupre had been tried was destroyed by an explosion. Sixteen people died. Why were so many people willing to follow Dupre to avenge his imprisonment? Of the... Why were so many people willing to follow Dupre to avenge his imprisonment? Of those arrested, some were congenital psychotics who would have killed anyway. The children had merely provided a pretext, and access to weapons and explosives. Most, though, showed a different profile. They had joined the children because they simply couldn't accept that the stars had gone out. And it meant nothing. Changed. Nothing. Dupre had proclaimed that the abyss marked the end of all moral order, and you can't ask for greater human relevance than that. For the sake of making sense of the world, to preserve themselves from the bubble's indifference, they swallowed his bleak conclusions. But you can't confirm the end of all moral order by pointing a telescope at the abyss. You can't measure it with apparatus of any kind. If you want, if you need... To believe in it, you have to go out and make it happen. You have to make it real. As the 27th anniversary of Bubble Day approached, not a city in the world was entirely immune from the tension. Those who had imprisoned Dupre had, singled out, had been singled out for punishment, but in the past, and especially on November 15th, the children had killed at random, and nobody believed that they'd abandoned that practice. Department stores x-rayed and strip-searched their customers, and home shopping suddenly turned fashionable again. Train schedules fell apart under the burden of endless security checks, and telecommuting underwent a revival. On November 9th, Dupre held a media conference in prison. He answered no questions, but read out a statement denouncing all acts of violence and calling on his followers to do the same. I took it for granted that he had been bribed or coerced somehow, and I doubted that anyone was in a position to know how many of the children were likely to obey him, but the media pushed the line that the statement amounted to some kind of miraculous reprieve, and the public hysteria certainly diminished. I just hoped that Dupre's followers were as easily manipulated as the rest of us. Four days let not been his own. The whole thing had been staged with a puppet mod. Illegally. The U.S. Supreme Court had reaffirmed, only months before, that the enforced application of a neural mod was unconstitutional, whatever the circumstances. And in any case, Maine had never even tried to pass a law allowing it. The prison governor resigned. The state's most senior FBI bureaucrat blew his brains out. More to the point, it was hard to imagine anything which could have enraged the children more. It was just after 2 a.m. on November 15th when Vincent Lowe and I responded to an alarm from a dockside container warehouse. People later asked us how we could have been foolhardy enough to walk alone into such obvious peril. What did they think? That the day's 80,000 burglaries worldwide could all be treated as potential terrorist atrocities at a cost of about one and a half million dollars each? Maine was on the other side of the planet. The children had struck in Australia only once, in a bungled attempted bombing which had killed only the bomber himself. Of course we walked right in. We accessed the warehouse security system first, though. The surveillance cameras showed nothing amiss, but something had tripped a motion detector. A passing train? It wouldn't have been the first time. The containers were laid out in rows. I moved down one aisle, Vincent another, while P2 let us see, simultaneously, through our own eyes and any, or all, of the sixteen ceiling-mounted cameras. I set off a small pyrotechnic device which sent thin streams of colored smoke wafting at random across our entire expanded field of view, a trick which betrays even the most sophisticated data chameleon. The cameras were clean. We were alone in the building. A few seconds later, though, we both felt the floor vibrating, very slightly. 
We shared sensory data to get a better parallax, and P2 pinned down the source of the vibrations to one container, in the second row from the left. I was about to switch the camera to uh, I was about to switch the camera above to infrared for what little that might have revealed when suddenly there was no need a pale transparent blue plasma jet punched through the steel of one of the walls of the container close to an upper corner and began smoothly slicing its way down Vincent queried the main warehouse system and said one Hitachi MA-52 mining robot on its way to the gold fields. That's when I felt about as much of a frisson as P-3 permitted. The container was 15 meters high. I'd seen MA-52s on HV. They looked like a cross between a tank and a bulldozer, scaled up considerably, sprouting a dozen steel appendages, each of which terminated in an assortment of wicked-looking tools. The things carried... The things carried out self-maintenance, which explained the plasma torch. Needless to say, any mining robot was supposed to be shipped unpowered. And, powered or not, should not have been able to wake spontaneously in transit and decide to cut itself free. At the very least, it had been completely reprogrammed, and it had probably been tampered with mechanically as well. All rules governing the behavior of the standard model could safely be considered void. There was no point tracking down the documentation for emergency deactivation codes. We were armed, of course. Our weapons could have melted through the robot's outer plate in about a decade. I notified the station of developments and put in a call for reinforcements. The plasma jet reached the bottom of its path and made a neat horizontal turn. There were six massive cranes fitted to the warehouse ceiling, one for each row of containers. By the time I'd given them a second glance, Vincent already had them under his control. The one we needed, though, was parked at the end of the building furthest from where we needed it, and it crawled along its track with unbelievable lassitude. I invoked P5's judgment of distances and velocities, then did the same for the plasma jet's progress. The container would be open at least 15 seconds before we could, we could start to raise it. But it was one row in from the edge of the grid, and the aisles were barely three meters wide. The MA-52 wouldn't have room to charge right out. It would have to clear a path first. That would buy us, as far, that would buy us far more than 15 seconds. The rectangle of steel came free then skidded down the aisle with a deafening screech, still balanced on its edge until it hit the far wall. As the robot, propelled by banks of maneuverable treads, rolled out as far as it could, the container slipped a short distance in the opposite direction. Ten or twenty centimeters, no more. Vincent cursed softly. Suboptimal! The crane lowered its grappling claw onto the container's misaligned roof. Locking pins, as thick as my arm, shot out in search of target holes, retracted in surprise, then cycled idiotically through the same action four more times, before giving up. A red light on the claw started flashing, an ear-splitting siren shrieked twice, then everything on the crane shut down. We'd kept our distance. It took me twenty seconds to reach the action, on the robot's blind side, by which time it had started ramming the container that blocked its path. Each time it backed away, its own container slid forward slightly. Each time it advanced, the opposite happened. But the net motion was backward. The robot was going to be hemmed in for several minutes, but any prospect of aligning the grappling claw was vanishing rapidly. Each container had a ladder welded to its side. As it happened, that was the side that had been cut away and discarded, so I climbed the container across the aisle and jumped the gap. Starting the claws swinging was much Starting the claw swinging was much harder than I'd expected. It hung from six cables, arranged as three pairs, and the pairing complicated and damped the motion. Gradually, though, I built up the oscillations until the claw was sweeping far enough to compensate for the container's displacement. Now it was just a matter of timing. There was no need for me to cue Vincent. The closest ceiling camera gave him a perfect view. P5 had no trouble extrapolating the motion of the swinging claw, but the lurching of the container was unpredictable. The crane's firmware didn't make things any easier. 
Each time Vincent commanded it to try to grab the container, it went through a hard-wired cycle of five attempts, and then shut down. The only freedom he had was to choose the moment he started the sequence. Three times the container shifted, throwing out all his calculations. The fourth time I knew it was our last chance. I could make the claw swing further horizontally, but the arc of its motion would lift it too high for the locking pins to engage. When it happened, it looked as miraculous, as improbable as something from a time-reversed movie, everything magically fitting together, like the fragments of a broken vase. Everything except one locking pin, out by some ludicrous, fra ludicrous fraction of a millimeter, stuck against the side of its hole while all the others continued to slide home. I could picture them all retracting again, the instant some idiot microprocessor gave up hope on that one jammed pin. I kicked it as hard as I could. It slipped into place. Primed or not, I felt a moment of dizzy jubilation. I ducked between the cables and jumped back across the aisle, as the crane's lifting motors burst noisily into life. Lifting motors, lifting motors, lifting motors. <laughs> I don't know, oh no! As the crane's lifting motors burst noisily into life. Then I clambered down the ladder and ran. The container rose smoothly. The MA-52, still two-thirds inside, had no choice but to rise with it. As its treads approached the height of the roof the, of the container which had blocked its way, I could almost imagine it making a leap for freedom. But the gap was too wide. The robot ascended helplessly to the ceiling, fifty meters above. I could hear sirens approaching. Our reinforcements were about to arrive. I met up with Vincent at the warehouse entrance. I said, now we wait for the army to come and blast the fucker into shrapnel. Vincent shook his head. No need. What do you mean? The safety features of this system, he said, leave a lot to be desired. He dropped it. Later, weapons were found in the debris which could have demolished a suburb or two, and it was only the children's incompetence which had kept that from happening. It turned out that they'd corrupted the security system of the wrong warehouse. If there'd been no early warning, the whole thing would have ended with the army having to take on the MA-52 in the streets. In three African cities, that was exactly what had happened, with heavy loss of life. Elsewhere, of course, there'd been the usual bombings, everything from incendiary devices to chemical shells spreading neurotoxins. I didn't want to know about it. I glanced at the headlines, then flipped screens, unwilling to swallow so soon the truth of how microscopic our victory had been. Despite having been merely lucky, Vincent and I were, predictably, portrayed as heroes. I didn't mind. It meant that I was now virtually guaranteed promotion to the counter-terrorist unit. The media attention was tiresome, but I gritted my teeth and waited for it to pass. Karen resented the whole thing, and I couldn't blame her. None of our friends seemed to want to talk about anything else, and she must have been as sick of hearing the story as I was of telling it. Still worse, Karen's well-meaning brother dropped in one Sunday afternoon with recordings of every interview I'd given. Primed, as the, as the department insisted, which we'd taken great pains to avoid when they'd been broadcast. We had to sit through them all. Karen loathed seeing me primed, almost as much as I did myself. "'The zombie boy scout,' she called me, and I couldn't disagree. The cop with my face on the HV was so bland, so earnest, so blinkered, so fucking sensible, it made me want to gag. There may be people born that way, but not many, and you pity them. Every cop has no less than six standard priming mods, P1 to P6, but it's P3 which imposes the mental state appropriate for active duty. It's P3 which really makes you primed. It had always been clear to me that what P3 did was cripple the brain, efficiently, reversibly, and to great advantage, but there was no point being squeamish or euphemistic about it. The priming mods made better cops. The priming mods saved lives. And the priming mods made us, temporarily, less than human. I could live with that, so long as I didn't have my nose rubbed in it too often. The 
priming drugs of the bad old days, a crude, purely pharmaceutical attempt to suppress emotional responses, heighten sensory awareness, and minimize reaction times, had caused a number of side effects, including unpredictable transitions between the primed and unprimed states, but the arrival of neural mods had banished all such complications. The partitioning of my life was simple, clear-cut, absolute. On duty, I was primed. Off duty, I wasn't. There was no possibility of ambiguity, no question of one side contaminating the other. Karen had no professional mods. Doctors, the eternal, conser the eternal conservatives, still frowned upon the technology. But differential malpractice insurance premiums, among other things, were gradually eroding their resistance. On December 2nd, I learned that my promotion had come through a few hours before I read about it in the evening news. That was a Friday. On the Saturday, Karen and I and Vincent and his wife Maria went out, to dinner to get, went out to dinner together to celebrate. Vincent had also been offered a position in the unit, but he'd declined. Bad career move, I said, only half teasing. We'd scarcely had a chance to discuss it before. Primed, such topics were unmentionable. Counterterrorism is a growth sector. Ten years in this unit, and I can quit the force and become an obscenely overpaid consultant to, mount to multinationals. He gave me an odd look and said, eh, I guess I'm, not that I'm just not that ambitious. And then he took Maria's hand and squeezed it. It was hardly an extravagant gesture, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. I woke in the early hours of Sunday morning, and I couldn't get back to sleep. I climbed out of bed. Karen could always sense my wakefulness, and it always seemed to disturb her far more than my absence. I sat in the kitchen, trying to come to a decision, but only growing more angry and confused. I hated myself, because I hadn't once stopped to think that I might be putting her at risk. We should have talked it through before I had accepted the promotion, and yet the very idea of any such discussion seemed obscene. How could I ask her? How could I acknowledge the slightest real danger and admit in the same breath that, with her permission, yes, I'd still go ahead and take the job? And if, instead, I simply changed my mind and turned it down without consulting her, in the end she'd drag the reason out of me, and she'd never forgive me for having excluded her from the decision. I walked over to a window and looked out at the brightly lit streets. Ever since the bubble, it seemed to me, streetlights had been growing more powerful year by year. Two cyclists rode by. The window pane shattered outward, and I followed the shards through the empty frame. Unbidden, the priming mods snapped into life. I curled up and rolled as I hit the ground. P4 saw to that. I lay on the grass for a second or two, bleeding and winded. I could hear the flames behind me. I could feel my heart accelerate and my skin grow cold as P1 shut down peripheral circulation, a controlled version of the natural adrenaline response. But I was insulated from my body's agitation. I had no choice but to remain calmly analytic. I got to my feet and turned around to assess the situation. Tiles from the roof were scattered on the lawn. The bomb must have been in the ceiling, close to the back of the house, probably right above the bedroom. I could see patches of a bubbling, gelatinous substance sliding down the, rem the remnants of the inside walls, carrying with it sheets of blue flame. I knew that Karen was dead. Not injured, not in danger. With nothing to shield her from the blast, she would have died instantly. I've thought about it a great deal since, and I always reach the same conclusion. Any ordinary person in the same situation would have run back in, would have risked their life. In shock, confused, disbelieving, would have done the most dangerous and futile thing imaginable. But the zombie boy scout knew there was nothing he could do, so he just turned and walked away. And, knowing the dead were beyond his help, he turned his attention to the needs of the survivor. That's grim. And that is the end of the chapter and where I'm going to have to call it for today. Uh, sorry. Um, I'll probably do two of them, uh, next week, because the next two are... they dovetail pretty well. 
Plus, it gets us to part two of the book. So it'll be fun. Alrighty. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, Greg Egan, as always, being thought-provoking, if very technical. Um, I do. If you are into science fiction and you really want to read like fairly gritty stuff, like down in the reeds, <laughs> just like absolutely, some of it absolutely out there, but very involved. I highly recommend checking Egan out. He's still contemporary. He's still releasing novels. He just came out with one last year, and I can't remember its name. Um, I haven't picked it up yet. Um, his more recent stuff has been incredibly out there. Like, uh, some of the most incredible exercises in world building I have ever seen. Uh, most people, when world building, usually use stuff, you know, familiar reference. Uh, some something you can recognize. Oh, okay, this is what I can relate to. This is, um, you know, uh, so so take a lot of your fantasy uh, world building. Um, basically, is going to crib notes from existing history, right? That's that's usually the way that works. Um, in most of those, you know, even take like 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 Dune. Take Dune for instance. Dune is a great example, and I love Dune, and I love Frank Herbert. Um, someday I'm going to do like. If, even if I don't read Dune aloud, I'm going to have like an entire discussion on what makes Dune, at least the Frank Herbert ser portion of the series, so mind-bogglingly brilliant for so many different reasons. We're not going to do that now, but Dune is incredible. But it's still basically pulling from, you know, it's it's you have the Middle East as a reference. You've got, um, you know, colonial... Uh, <laughs> You know, European superpowers um, who, who want to run the show. You've got feudal systems. You've got a lot of stuff that we basically, through history, find fairly familiar. Greg Egan says, screw all that. I'm going to come up with completely different laws of physics and chemistry. Uh, and the only familiar referent is characters that basically seem like fam behave in moderately familiar ways. Um except they're a lot cleverer maybe than they should otherwise be. Um, so like they'll make your brain itch, but the arrow of time trilogy is completely out there. What's it called? Clockwork rocket. I don't remember what it's called offhand. Um, I keep calling it the arrow of time trilogy. It might have a different name that I'm not remembering. Um, uh, and it basically runs on the proviso. And you know this early on, like in the first book of the trilogy, like the entire goal is send a spacecraft out in this universe that has very specific laws of physics that allow for this. Um, basically send a spacecraft out, get it so it moves at a certain speed, and it'll basically loop around and come back in time. And they want to do this in order to... Uh, in order to do special things. Um, I won't spoil more than that, but that's that's their goal. And it's like, it makes no bones, bones about this. And it's like basically about their journey and the trials and travails they go through. Um, and it's brilliant. It's really good, but it's, man, like, you know it gets serious when he starts breaking out the charts and graphs. <laughs> like, he goes all in and it is like, really granular and really, really hard for the layperson to read. Um, I am a layperson. It was hard for me. I had a hard time. Uh, I do want to reread them. Dichronauts, a more recent novel, though, felt a lot more accessible. I think partly because it didn't try to explain all the mathematics of what was going on all the time. But instead, kind of, I felt did a better job of putting you into the position of a character living in the world that they lived in, which is like a 2.5D world where you can't turn left or right, but you can walk forward or back. Uh, if you turn left or right, you get stretched out of axis and you like explode or whatever. Um, it's it's daffy. I, I'm not explaining it well. And you... Like it is going on to his website and reading his scientific explanation. This is what I was thinking of when I did this is practically mandatory. Like you have to, otherwise it makes, you have no idea what's going on most of the book. And it's like, well, why don't you just like walk there? It's like, no, <laughs> they, cause the characters all take it basically as accepted rote. 
like here's the things you do here's the things you can't do there are explanations forthcoming in the book but like the way the plot develops only works because of the way the world works and it is brilliant it's incredible world building um in my opinion so i get excited about greg egan but he is not easily approached uh but i highly recommend him i that's why i recommend usually uh start with his short story collections because those are very accessible. I find them accessible. Quarantine feel like his older work feels really easy to get into. This one, like he started going ham with uh, the technical jargon and a bunch of other stuff, and he'll do that. But a lot of his short story collections are light on jargon and much more about like, here's cool idea A, B, and C. How do these work? How do people live around this? How does this affect society? How does this affect individuals? So he's great at doing really classic science fiction, but then also great at being like, I'm just going to come up with a totally different world, totally different laws, totally different everything, um, and going nuts. He's great. He's brilliant. Um, okay, uh, this has been your Greg Egan fanboy power hour. And now I'm going to run. <laughs> so yeah, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, if you didn't tune in, totally okay. Um, these are rough. Uh, this is my daily reminder that I do do these all live on Fridays uh, at about starting at about noon Eastern time. Um, I have fun. I enjoy doing these. I hope other people are digging them. Uh, later today or tomorrow morning, I will have the YouTube channel, uh, everything put into their proper playlists. I meant to do that last week. I didn't get to it, but we are now, so it'll be fine. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, basically I do I do stream this, like I said, every week, every Friday, uh, free read Fridays, where I read short stories and indeed entire novels aloud. Uh, this week uh, I was, we read another chapter in Quarantine by Greg Egan. Uh, I do other streams throughout the week. I have Mecha Mondays where I do something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent. Um, this Monday, this coming Monday, I'll probably be doing... Because uh, I had forgotten that it was going to be out this weekend and Monday, uh, a stream for the closed network test of Gundam Evolution, which is a first-person shooter, objective-based multiplayer PvP game, kind of, kind of like uh, Overwatch with Gundams uh, and mobile suits. It's pretty okay. It's not terrible. Um, I have I take umbrage with some of the design decisions, but mostly the game's pretty tight. Um, so I'll probably be doing that uh, unless they shut the servers down early for some reason, which they shouldn't. Um, I also do a Warframe Wednesdays stream where I do Warframe for a couple hours because everybody has to have a crowd pleaser, I guess. If you're not streaming a big popular game, why are you streaming? Well, because I have a favorite stream, and that's Free Read Fridays. Um. I came up with my streaming schedule years ago and it has just kind of stuck with me and it has worked. So I'm not popular and that's fine. Um, I'm not going to ask you to like or subscribe. If you're wondering why I did that last week, it's because last week was April Fool's Day and it was a joke. The whole thing was a joke. Um, I am super glad that somebody appreciated it though. Uh, and was like, oh yeah, I love Frank Zappa. This was awesome. You remind me of a friend. So thanks to that guy whose name I don't remember because I don't have the YouTube page up, blah, 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 blah. But hey, thanks to you. Um, I'm glad it wasn't unappreciated. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for tuning in. Stay safe, stay sane, and uh, be decent to each other. And on that note,